Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today, we're going to do a deep dive on another Neville Goddard lecture, Awake, O Sleeper. If you got a chance to try out my sleep meditation, the New Earth, I Am Jesus Christ Awakening meditation, I got a lot of comments that there was one particular part they didn't like, and that was where it says, Awaken, O Sleeper, Arise from the Dead which I say at one portion of the meditation. And it's very interesting. This is what Neville Goddard says you will hear as a part of your awakening. Now, to go back to the other lectures, to understand what this is coming from, Neville Goddard is arguing that God is within you, actually lodged in your skull, asleep. And you are slowly awakening this part of you that is God is awakening and so I thought that would just be a cool thing to hear while I'm sleeping is awaken O sleeper arise from the dead your plan is at hand so Neville Goddard talks a little bit more about this in this lecture there are two different kinds of lectures that Neville Goddard gives the ones on the law and imagination and the ones on the promise I've done several on the law recently, and I wanted to do this one to give some context to that meditation and to further explore the promise. While a lot of this stuff is the same, there is a lot more detail given and some new stories as well. And it's still very fascinating to me. And in my goal to read all of the lectures of Neville Goddard, this one just stood out to me. So I wanted to read it and share it with you. Also, there's an interesting Q&A period where Neville elaborates more on this theory that we all live once and then when we die, we come back at a regular age and we continue to live until we learn and awaken from within. I've never quite understood. It is an idea that's proposed by Swedenborg, who was also talked about by William Blake, and I want to get more information about it. Awake, O Sleeper, by Neville Goddard, January 8th, 1968. First of all, I want to thank you for your cards and letters. And again, may I ask you to share with us your dreams and your visions and your experiences in applying this principle, this simple principle that imagining does create reality. So share it with us that I, in turn, may share it with the others and encourage the faith of all. We have to go forward and take you beyond anything that we've ever done before. It's part of the game. Now tonight's title is Awake, O Sleeper. You will find this in the fifth chapter of Ephesians, Awake, O Sleeper, and Arise from the Dead, verse 14. Now, what person rationally would grasp it? You see, the Bible is addressed to the imagination, which is spiritual sensation, and only but immediately to the understanding or reason. If you try to grasp it through reason, well, it doesn't make sense. How could I speak to someone and tell him that he's not only asleep, but he's dead? I equate sleep with death. And tell a man that I am addressing to awake you, sleeper, and arise from the dead. I am telling him he has entered a world of eternal death, but doesn't know it. And maybe he doesn't believe it, for he's a rational being. In the Old Testament, in the 44th chapter of the book of Psalms, we read, Rouse thyself. Why sleepest thou, O Lord, awake? So it's addressed to the Lord. All the commands of Scripture are addressed to the Lord and fulfilled by the Lord. There is nothing but the Lord. So we start on the greatest confession of faith that man has ever received through revelation. It's called the Hebrews' confession of faith, the Shema. Here, O Israel, The Lord our God, the Lord is one. It's a compound unity, one made up of others, for the word is Elohim, 
the gods. Now I will tell you, I firmly believe in God. I don't have to believe in God, for I stood in the presence of the risen Lord, who embraced me and incorporated me into his one body. And from that moment back in 1929, I am one with the body of the risen Lord. So here is the Lord. I don't have to believe in it. But I will tell you, using the word belief, I believe in God. I believe also that men are gods and that collective man is God. That we are the gods spoken of in the 82nd Psalm, which we are told is the most difficult of all the Psalms for the scholars to unravel. If it ever had any meaning, they said, the meaning has long been lost. This is what stumps them. It's quoted in the 10th chapter of the book of John. But we go back to the origin, the 82nd Psalm. And God has taken his place in the divine assembly. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. Verse 1. Now he speaks. I say you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you, nevertheless. Now here comes the future prophecy. All this is a present fact. You are gods now, sons of the Most High now. Nevertheless, ye shall die as men and fall as one man, O ye princes. Verse 6. Here is a prophecy. You'll fall as one man. Is the fall the result of disobedience as we are taught? Is the fall something that is a punishment? I tell you, it is not. The fall is a plan. It's a pretext, an assumed appearance in order to conceal the real intention. The real intention is an expansion, a further existence, an ultimate birth. That's the real intention. And the gods fell as one man, one man. He chose us in himself before the foundation of the world. And as one man fell, it fragmented itself into the unnumbered men of the world. We are the gods in disguise, not recognizing our brotherhood, not recognizing ourselves. Now, we go to the beginning of Genesis and take it from there. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon man. And while he slept, he took from man a rib. And from that rib, he made a woman. And bringing the woman before man, man said, At last, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh she shall be called woman for she was taken out of man therefore man must leave father and mother and cleave to his wife and they become one flesh genesis 221 through 224 now through the eyes of reason you discount it it's all a myth it's stupid we know biologically that's stupid. May I tell you it is true, but not as the world sees it. To understand it, you must have the vision. It must be revealed to you that man has no body distinct from his soul. That called body is only a portion of soul discerned by the five senses. The chief inlets of soul in this world, Blake, marriage of heaven and hell. This body is Eve. This is my emanation, my vegetated mortal wife, my emanation yet my wife, till the sleep of death is over. This is Eve. Whether it be male or female makes no difference. This is my emanation, the Jerusalem in every individual man. I am adjoined to you and you to me by our emanative portion which is the Jerusalem in every man. And this Jerusalem is the Jerusalem below 
that bears sons into slavery. Everyone comes in wrapped in this garment that is his emanative portion, and he's enslaved in this world of eternal death. There's another Jerusalem. The one who emanates is the Jerusalem from above, and that is the emanation of the Lord that is hidden from view. But it is one with this. This is my Eve. I become so much one with Eve that if you struck me tonight and caused me pain, I scream out, I am in pain. Well, what is his name by which all men must know him forever and forever? I am. Go to the people of Israel and tell them I am has sent you. That is my name forever throughout all generations. Exodus 3.14 So when you strike this body, I'm so much a part of my wife to which I have cleaved that strike her and you strike me. For I say I am in pain and I go on throughout. So take this from me. Destroy this temple and I will in three days raise it up again. They said, what in three days when it took us 46 years to build it? That's how the mind of man thinks. They think only in terms of an external thing made with human hands, knowing that he spoke of the temple of his body. For know ye not that ye are the temple of the Lord, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. 2 Corinthians 6.16 That's what Paul asked us in his letter to the Corinthians that we are, actually this is the temple. He dwells in his wife, he cleaves to her, and they become one. So this is the only Eve of Scripture. There never was another Eve. Every being born in this world, male or female, that is Eve, and the one who emanated it, that soul that emanated it, is the man spoken of. It's capitalized in the translation in scripture in the second chapter of Genesis that she came out of man. And man is capitalized, generic man. So when I fell, I fell in one body. And falling in one body, I entered my cave and I met my savior in the grave. Some find a female garment there and some a male, woven with care, Blake. So I found a male garment. My wife found a female garment, but she is neither female and I'm not a male, we are man. For man in the resurrection is above the organization of sex. He is not the divided being, as we are told in Galatians. In Christ is neither male nor female, neither bond nor free, neither Greek nor Jew, neither black nor white. We are simply above the whole organization in this world of eternal death. So when Blake speaks to us in his greatest work, Jerusalem. He first takes the theme. Having stated the theme, he tells it of the sleep of Ulro. Well, the sleep of Ulro refers to life in this world as we know it, right here in this world. This world seems to be of an, an ultimate, endless state. There is no end to it. It goes on and on. It also seems to us to have no purpose, for tonight the richest man will die leaving it all behind him, and the poor man will die, he goes to the pauper's grave. But in the end, given the same length of time, both turn into dust and bones. You will dig out one grave and find you can't tell who it is. It's all nothing. It seems to have no purpose. And yet man has to enter this world, regardless of what he seems to achieve in the world. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in the eyes of the Lord. No matter how wise he seems to be, it is stupid in the eyes of God, and the strength of man isn't equal to the weakness of God. So let them strut across the stage and see all the things that they see, and it still is nothing. So it seems to be that here there is no end to futility, and there is no purpose. And yet man has to pass through it and awaken from it into eternal life. So he starts his theme and he lays the theme out. He is writing about this of the sleep of Uro 
and of the passage through the eternal death and of the awakening to eternal life. Now he tells us, this theme calls me night after night in sleep, and every morn awakes me at sunrise. Then I see the Savior over me spreading his beams of love and dictating the words of this mild song. That's how he starts it. Now he starts the dictation, and he swears in his letter to his friend Butts that the whole thing came by immediate dictation. He said, I did not write it. I can brag about it. I can praise it, because I dare not pretend to be anyone other than the secretary. The authors are in heaven, and it's the grandest poem that this world contains, for the spirit of truth dictated it. Morning after morning, as he woke it, was dictating twelve, sometimes twenty, and sometimes thirty lines at a time. And what now seems to be the labor of a long life was produced without labor or study, and quite often against my will, but I had to take it down. He would rise and take it down, and his wife Catherine would rise with him and sit in the silence while William recorded it. Sometimes she would hold his hand as he recorded it because he was simply completely possessed by the Spirit as it wrote through him. And he's writing down this greatest of all poems, Jerusalem. This is how he starts it. Awake, awake, O sleeper of the land of shadows. Wake, expand, I am in you and you in me. Mutual in love divine. That being in whom we were contained, that being who fell deliberately for a purpose, to expand beyond its glory, because only by this contraction into the state called death could it expand. We have that told us in the story of the parable of the seed, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it brings forth much. John 12, 24. Here, we have a have in this little story of the grain of wheat. It set forth the mystery of life through death. If I want an extension of living, an extension of reality, an extension of existence, I must contract and die and empty myself of my glory, which I had with the Lord before that the world was. Entering into one body one body falls and the world tells it as a mistake it's no mistake it's a plan god planned everything as it has come out and as it will be consummated in the end when the mask comes off after you awake you are enhanced beyond your wildest dream by reason of the passage through death and your awakening to eternal life. When we all awake, we are the ones who knew each other more intimately than anyone on earth could ever know. How could I ever know? My wife and I think the same thoughts through the day. There isn't a day that I will voice something she's been thinking about it. She voices something I've been thinking about it. But no matter how intimate our thoughts are in the sharing it can't compare to the intimacy that is ours when these garments are taken off and we are once more awakened in to eternal life so awake O oh sleeper well you can't really awake by doing anything that you are taught to do may i tell you they'll tell you don't eat meat and you'll awaken. Don't go to that church, you'll awaken. Don't do so and so, all the don'ts. You could do nothing and never awaken. You can do everything and not awaken. But may I tell you, that seems extravagant, and it is, because all will awaken but not by any effort on their part while they're here. You will awaken at the moment in time that was predetermined that you would awaken. 
whether you be shining shoes at the time or whether you be employing a million people our government today undoubtedly has on its payroll millions of people and the one who is given credit is our president he is the head and so in a technical sense he employs a million and tonight the one shining his shoes could awaken and he falls sound asleep and continues the dream but he cannot die that's the glorious part this emanation take it from me now and in three days I'll raise it up again so this body of mine shoot it if you will cut off its head it's my emanation and therefore I believing myself to be it I will find myself in the immediate present wearing the same body only it will be new no part will be missing no bridge work no fillings in my teeth no gray hair no need to wear glasses and no need to wear any aid in this world I will be a young man 20 years old just as I snuff out this and you call it dead I'll be wearing a garment same as before in a world terrestrial just like this and continue the journey until I awake but I can tell you I have awakened so when I take this off whenever it's taken off I will no longer be in this world for this world does not terminate at the point where our senses cease to register it so when a man cannot follow those who are called dead as we call them dead only because of his limitations he can't follow them but the one you call dead isn't dead to himself he emanated the body that you knew he emanates the same body same body beautiful enhanced beyond your wildest dreams and he continues not even knowing that he has gone through the door death is no more than leaving one room for another in the same fabulous terrestrial world that is called in the mysteries eternal death and from which man will one day awaken into eternal life but having descended and entered the world of death when he now awakens he is expanded and that was the purpose there is no limit to expansion God set a limit to contraction to opacity but not to translucence or expansion and so we descended not because of anything that we ever did that was wrong not one thing was wrong so if I emanate this body which I did destroy it when you will I will if I have not awakened I'll emanate the same body and you cannot reach me I may find myself tomorrow in a different section of time not an extension of this like 1969 or 68 I may be in the year 3000 I may be in the year 1000 whatever is best fitted for the work yet to be done in me in order to bring about the awakening and the expansion into an extension of existence so here is what we are so just think of it God made man in his own image you're told male female made he them Genesis 1 26 and 27 that's the first chapter the second changes it somewhat and it tells a different story but it's not a contradiction if you see it through imagination here he fashions him out of the dust and breathes into his nostrils the breath of life and he becomes a living soul but his destiny is to become a life-giving spirit not just a living soul an animated body so the purpose of the fall of the sons of God is to transform them into an entirely different world being life-giving spirits animating bodies not being an animated body but animating the whole vast world around him and closing it off at will and starting it again and that is our destiny now reason cannot grasp it and every scholar 
when he comes to this, the first thing, and you can't blame any man who has never had the vision. He says, it's a myth. Certainly it's a myth, a rib of my side. Take my body apart, no rib is missing. Take yours apart, unless you had one cut out for some operation on the lung. But if you have not lost a rib through operation, no rib is as every man's rib, not one is missing. Yet you're told in scripture, one was taken out, but the word rib, you know what it means. The Hebrew word is tesala. It means a portion, literally of a person. It also is translated when you want to write the word quarter in Hebrew, you have tesala. We speak of the fourfold man, four faces stood every man. It means a side. Well, the side may not be this side or that side or that side or this side. It's a portion. It's trying to say a portion of the soul emanates. That's what it's trying to tell man. But if you don't see it that way, and Tasala only means a rib, literally a little rib, well then it's translated a curve. So because it means a curve, the curve of a man's structure would be the rib. Well, if you wanted to write rib, yes. If you want to write a pane of wood, the flooring on the ground, the same is Tasala. It could be a piece of wood, but a piece, not the whole, a portion. Tasala is a portion of the soul that emanates. When it emanates, then he from whom it emanates must leave everything and cleave to his emanation, and they become one flesh. Well, you've cleaved to your emanation so much so that you identify yourself with it. And so, if I ask you, who are you? You give me your name, but you first say, I am. Then you put a name on it. If I strike that thing that you say you are and I hurt it, well, then you say, I am in pain. You call upon the name of God and say, God is in pain. You didn't say, God is in pain. You said, I am. Well, that's his name. You tell that the gods came down to earth? So again, let me repeat, I not only believe in God because I stood in the presence of the risen God, but I believe that all men are gods and that collective man is God. So when you hurt man, you hurt God. And when you hurt man, you hurt yourself because you are God. There's nothing but God only God in this world. And may I tell you, and this is not from speculation, God is love. In spite of the horrors of the world, God is love. For when you stand in his presence, you can't feel anything but love. And when God embraces you and you become one with God, you have never felt such ecstasy, not in eternity. You can't describe the joy, the ecstasy that is yours when you are embraced by the risen Lord. From then on, you're incorporated into the body of God. As we're told in the sixth chapter of the book of Romans, for he who is united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Verse 5. Only one body, only one spirit, only one Lord, only one God and Father of all, and you are that. So in the end, the one who commanded the fall for this fabulous purpose, you will awaken. And you are the one who commanded it, for he is Father. And you will awaken right here in this world of death as the Father the only one that can reveal to you that you are a father is God's only begotten son, David, calling you father. For David in the spirit calls Christ Lord. And the word Adonai is the name used for the father. And for in Hebrew, they do not often use the yod heh vav 
because it's a sacred name. And so they substitute Adonai for the word yod heh vav -Heh. And so David in the spirit calls Christ Adonai, my Lord. In other words, my father, for every son spoke of his father as my Lord, fulfilling scripture. For the second psalm is, and David said, I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said unto me, Thou art my son. Today I have begotten thee. Verse 7. This David, the David, the only David of biblical fame, will stand before you and call you father. And then you know who you are. This comes after you've been awakened from above, born from above. And then comes the son calling you father. Then the entire drama unfolds within you, and you will know exactly who you are. That you are the one spoken of in scripture as the gods who gathered. We agreed then to dream in concert, so that when you and I see a building, we may see it differently. You may see it through the eyes of one who would like to own it. I may see it through the eyes of one who admires it, with no feeling of possession. But we do see the same building, only we see it differently. So when we descended, we agreed to dream in concert. So while we walk this earth, we see the same streets. Therefore, we know the same number. And we can go where we want to go because we are dreaming in concert. But we are dreaming, my dears, the whole vast world is the dream of the gods who descended. But because we agreed to dream in concert, there's no confusion. Had we agreed to dream individually and all play solo, this would be the wildest, maddest thing in the world. But we agreed to dream in concert. Now may I tell you, when I invite you to go all out and to imagine that you are now the man, the woman, that you want to be, some will tell you, that will lead to madness. May I tell you, it will not. The only thing that would lead to madness would be to doubt it. The minute doubt sets in and you would like to believe it, but reason tells you it isn't true and you begin to doubt, then descends what the world would call a mental division, a certain madness, for doubt is the only devil in the world. That's doubt. If you could go all out and believe it, then regardless of what the whole vast rational world will tell you, you won't go mad. The whole thing will become a part of your dream world. You'll bring it into and fit it in without any difficulty into the world. Someone born poor, very poor. He began to dream that he had wealth, that he had fame. While at the moment, it would seem insane. His dream, but he persisted in his dream. But when the dream became true, and his fame was established and his wealth established, it seemed perfectly natural to those not knowing his dream. So everyone is dreaming. But if you begin to doubt your dream and still try to make it true, but doubting all the time, you're heading towards a little breakup. But you will not break up if you go all out in your wonderful claim that you are what you desire to be. Because all things are possible to God. And the God spoken of is right where you are seated. That's the God of whom the Bible speaks. So when the gods came down in the likeness of men, here they are. And some found a female garment there, and some a male woven with care. So God himself enters death's door, this door of death. 
the body, always with those who enter and lays down in the grave with them in visions of eternity, until they awake and see Jesus and the linen clothes lying there, which the females had woven for them, Blake, Milton. They seem to be woven in the womb of a woman, and they were no question about it. But they were simply emanations of a soul woven in the womb of a woman between a cooperation of a male and female. But the soul emanating is neither male nor female, for it emanates a male garment or a female garment, and it wears it in this world of death. And take it off emanates it again, this time without the use of the womb of a woman, doesn't need it anymore. For we are told in the ninth chapter of Hebrews, for as it was appointed for all men to die once, and then comes the judgment. So Christ was offered once for the sins of many, and then he will appear a second time, not concerning sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting for him. Verse 27. Well, you've died already. Forget the death. When you go before I go, it may be said of you that you died. I will hear the news that so and so died. You didn't die at all. You already died. You only die once. When we fell all in one body, that's when we died. We left our heavenly home and the glory that was ours to come down and assume the limitations of the flesh, which is called that of a slave. So we have already died. If we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Romans 6, 5. So the death is over. Only once do you die. So when you go through the gate, and men call you dead, you aren't dead. You simply emanate the same body, only it's young, it's new, 20 years old. Nothing missing, unaccountably new. You can't explain it, and may I tell you, the majority who go through don't even know they've gone through. And take the young body for granted, just as we take everything in this world for granted. A miracle goes on all day long in my body. I eat tonight's dinner and it has been converted unknown to my conscious reasoning mind into blood, to tissue, to bone, and no man on earth can make one drop of blood. Transplant a heart, but he can't grow one. Transplant all kinds of organs, but he can't grow one. He can't make one drop of blood. They've been trying forever, but they can't make a drop of living blood. They can't make one hair of the head. So they said now this man would have lived three weeks if he didn't have the transplant. So we'll give him the transplant. And he lived 18 days. And that's the first one in South Africa. And suppose the other one does live. He will not live one hour beyond his span of time as told us in the Sermon on the Mount. Who by being anxious can add one hour to his span of life? Man goes blindly on believing that he can do these things and all that is doing is publicizing the surgeons and the medical world. It isn't doing a thing to this being that you really are for you are not anything he thinks you are. So I'm dying, poor old heart is all gone, liver gone, all things gone. I should get out and emanate something new and wear it. And they're going to put a new heart in me. They're all hoping this night that someone will die suddenly. And they get their heart so that the doctor can have the experiment. If they didn't die suddenly and leaving a good heart, they couldn't use it, so let her be good and healthy but die. Either kill her or do something and let her give the heart. And they're using that and the people are eating it up as though, isn't that marvelous? Isn't this fantastic? 
and the world goes blindly on in the world of sleep, not knowing who they are. So I tell you, you are the Adam made in the image of God, that is the Son of God. And out of you came your Eve, and Eve is the body that you are wearing, and you cleave to it. You cleave to it so tightly that finally you become one flesh, so that whenever it is hurt, you are, and that is the Adam and Eve of Scripture. Therefore, it is not a myth. It does not come out of you, but certainly not out of this little bone in my side called a rib. For the word tasala means a portion. That's what it means. So man has no body distinct from his soul. That called body is a portion of soul discerned by the five senses. The chief inlets of soul in this age, Blake, that's all that it is. You are a living soul destined to become a life-giving spirit. So as you fall, you emanate a body because you have to have a body to function in this world. You can automatically do it. The minute you fall dead, you aren't dead at all. You're alive and a body is emanating out of your own being, young, new, not one part missing, nothing missing. If you had an arm missing, the arm is not missing. If you had all your limbs off, as many today have all those off after the war, they are not missing. The whole thing is replaced, and when they're replaced, he takes it for granted. I know I meet them. I can't persuade them that they've died. How can I tell a man who is alive, who is talking to me, that you died? He laughs at you. So if I tell you that you're sound asleep, wouldn't you laugh at me? If I tell you that you're not only sound asleep, but you're dead, well, now you'll say, Neville is mad. Don't go and hear him. That man is mad. He is a demon. But I have company that is what they said of the risen Christ in the 10th chapter of the book of John. Why listen to him? He's dead. He's mad. He has a demon. Verse 19. And he said to them, what did he say? Why do you stone me? For what good work? For no good works, but for your blasphemy, for you being a man, claim that you're God. Well, he said, Is it not written in your law? I said, Ye are gods. If he calls you gods to whom the word of God came, then why when he whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world claims that he is the Son of God, that you should say he blasphemes. Verses 32 to 36. He doesn't make a claim greater than the other. They don't know they are the Son of God. He's only trying to awaken man that you are the sons who came down. He makes no claim that he is a greater than. He said, I'm going to my father and your father. Go and tell my brethren I am ascending unto my father and to your father, to my God and to your God. John 20, 17. He didn't make a claim that his father differed from your father or that his God differed from your God. But they couldn't understand the mystery. They tried to get it right straight through the reasoning mind. And it isn't you can't get it that way. The whole thing is spoken to the imagination, which is God. Man is all imagination. And God is man and exists in us and we in him. The eternal body of man is the imagination. And that is God himself. Blake. Annotations to Berkeley. Lacoon. Now let us go into the silence. At the end of these lectures... Neville, in his original lectures, would give two minutes of silence, as I will do here. And there are some good questions and answers after this.
question. Neville, I have to take it on hearsay that I was born, but I remember being a little boy. Now, if I'm coming back at 20 years old, how does that differ from this manifestation that I'm in now? Answer. I go back to my own experiences. It was given to man to die once. To be born once. But he's born a second time, but not in this world. On the second time, he's born into an expanded world. That's why he came here. To achieve that expansion which is that birth that ultimate birth that extended reality or extended life extended living after all there is no limit to God so he has to expand and expand and expand so he conceives a drama which will allow him to contract forget who he is and then expand no man can keep on expanding unless he first contracts now you recall yourself as a little child. I do too. But I do not know of any other kind of birth than this one that you and I have gone through. When I meet my friends who are gone, they're all around 20 years old. And may I tell you, they don't know they're gone. When I met Jack, Jack said to me, who's dead? I said, Jack, you aren't dead, but you died. He said, Neville, you are so stupid. How can I not be dead? And yet I died. I told him exactly where I saw his body put into the ground in Haverstraw, New York. I went up there. I said, you had a marvelous, good Catholic funeral. Your sister insisted on a Catholic funeral. So you had a Catholic funeral. I met the priest and you are buried in the ground. Oh, he said, that's stupid. Well, there he was. He didn't even know he had gone. It was six months after he had gone. Well, Jack lived the same life here, Jack told me. He died at 50. He said, Neville, I've never dreamt in my life. You say you dream and you say you have visions. I have never had a dream in my life. I said, you haven't, Jack? I would go home. Jack slept in my apartment before we were married. After Bill and I got married, well, then he got himself a room. But prior to that, for years, Jack was in my apartment. I had a suite of rooms in a hotel. I'm going out at night and Jack, if he ever got on his back to the rafters, would just scream out. He snored so I'd say, come on, Jack, turn over. He'd turn over just like a little tiny tot, always a babe. And many a night I would say, oh, Jack. He'd say, yes, Nev, yes, Nev. I said, isn't she pretty? Where is she? Where is she? Over there. She's looking at you. Oh, yes, she is. Blonde haired. See it? Yes. He saw everything I'm telling him he's seeing. One night. He was snoring so hard. I said, I'm going to wake him up. So I said to Jack, look, Jack, look. What, Nev? All in his sleep. I said, look at that cat. He said, where? I said, on your head. He's messing on you. Look what he's doing. He jumped up from the bed, tearing his hair out of his head this way at this cat. I said, Jack, did you have a dream? Oh, no, no, no. He didn't even know he had the dream. And I am telling him a cat is on his head and he's messing on him. And he jumps in the bed, starts pulling his gray hair out. He had very short hair, lots of it, but very short. And there is Jack pulling his cat off his head. I said, well, Jack, what did you dream? I didn't dream, Nev. Didn't dream, didn't dream. And then he got out of bed and he went and got himself a glass of milk. And that was Jack. In this life, he went through life. He never had a dream. He tells me, and I could make him dream anything I wanted him to dream. I could go into that room and do anything with Jack, and he told me he never had a dream. So he's the same Jack he was then. He's just a sound asleep as he was then. He's totally unaware of the change. He is Jack dying at 50. He looked older. I meet him and he's 20. It doesn't register in his brain that a miracle has happened, that he's 20. I knew he had fillings in his teeth. I knew he did. He didn't have any now. Perfect teeth. And it never occurs to him, this is a miracle. People go through this and they still don't register until you awake. Those who are awake are sent through to try to tell them by asking them to compare something to this. And the mind can't be held that long. The interest wanders. And so in this wonderful world of ours, we are sound asleep, likened unto death. And we still, it doesn't register. 
I am telling you tonight, you are the God spoken of in Scripture. In that 82nd Psalm, I have the most wonderful work at home. It's called the most critical and the greatest criticism of a scholarly nature of the Bible that was ever given to man. It's called the Encyclopedia Biblica. The editor of that great work, there were many, 150 worked on it over the years, but the editor of the entire work was Thomas Cheney. He was considered the outstanding Hebrew scholar, and he writes his commentary on the 82nd Psalm. He said, the ideas might have been perennial, but they are long since vanishing from the mind of man. There is no understanding that man has today concerning what this psalm is trying to say, that God has taken his place in the divine assembly. Man can't quite see it. Well, I entered that assembly. I know it's true. And then he said to the gods, I say, you are gods, all of you, sons of the Most High. Now comes his prophecy. Nevertheless, you shall die like men and fall as one man, O ye princes. Then comes the plan. It's a play. It's a purpose. We didn't do anything that was wrong. We rejoiced because we were going to have the opportunity of further expansion. And may I tell you, it starts with the crucifixion. And the crucifixion is ecstasy beyond measure. Afterwards, it goes into horrors, but you're going to play the entire part. And you aren't going to awaken until you've played the whole part. Then you can say with Paul, I have finished the race. I have finished the race and I have fought the good fight and I have kept the faith. Henceforth is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. 2 Timothy 4 7. For I'm crowned with the laurel crown, the victory, having gone through the entire thing. When he awakens, he still is in the eyes of those who knew him, the same man, the same weaknesses, the same limitations. Knowing him by reason of the weaknesses that they know, therefore they say, oh silly, it means nothing, so I know him. I knew him when, and when I knew him, then he is still the same man now, so what? So what is he talking about? He's telling me he's had the experiences recorded in scripture of Jesus Christ. And here is a man with weaknesses. He gets a head cold. I knew it. He goes to the barber, gets his hair chopped off too. And he does all the normal things that men do. And he has to perform all the normal functions of a body. For this body of his is the same kind of body that he's always worn. And he has to perform the normal functions of that body as though the one they think of as Jesus Christ didn't. Ever stop to think about that? You say he lived 33 years and he didn't perform the normal natural functions of the body? Did he eat? If he ate, he certainly performed functions. But no one wants to think about it because they don't know who Jesus Christ really is. I tell you, if there be another Christ other than him whom all men are crucified or who is crucified on all men, he is a false Christ. And anyone who teaches you of such a Christ is a false teacher. The only Christ is the Christ that is crucified on man right here. That's the only Christ. He rose in man and he continues to rise in men. Everyone that rises, he gathers into his one body. So in the end, there's only one body, one spirit, one Lord, one God and Father of all. Ephesians 4.4 Doesn't make sense, does it? How can you take billions of people and incorporate them into one body? Well, I tell you, it's true. I am in the body of Christ, and yet I walk this earth, and this Christ is omnipresent. Wherever I am there, he is. And wherever you are, there he is. Though we are poles apart because he's omnipresent, and yet it's one body. It's not a big balloon body, it's just the body, it's man. So when Blake made the statement, If thou humblest thyself, thou humblest me, for thou 
Two dwellest in eternity. Thou art a man. God is no more. Thine own humanity learn to adore. And good night. So this is an important lecture. One question that I have received many, many times regarding Neville Goddard's belief system is this unusual idea that Neville Goddard explains about dying. And it haunts me, to be honest. It's very personal to me. If you got a chance to read my book, The Reality Revolution, I tell my story where I had this near-death experience. I should have died. Bullet was shot at me and the bullet bounced off my back. So, of course, I'm constantly thinking I probably died when that happened. And then woke up and continued on in my life. Now, he's saying here, we, we return to the age of 20, all right? And he's saying something that's very bizarre, that we wake up in a 20-year-old body and have memories, and it's as if we don't even know it happened. Now, the other bizarre thing about this lecture, and come on, you have to admit, this is crazy, that Neville is saying that he is new people in life that had died and then saw them again in his life at 20 years old. But the thing I'm getting from this that I don't understand is... This 20-year-old still recognized Neville. How did that happen? Don't they realize they're 20? I don't understand it. Can somebody please help me to understand this? There is not a belief like this of the afterlife except for one system, which is Swedenborg. Swedenborg is mentioned in William Blake's poetry, particularly the marriage between heaven and hell. So I've gone and looked up Swedenborg, and that's a whole rabbit hole to fall into. There's thousands of pages. This was a man that in Latin wrote about the afterlife and said that he spoke with angels and during his life he was able to document in Latin uh, the afterlife in detail and his idea of the afterlife was that once you die you come back in a regular body and you continue to go through these lessons. Here Neville is talking about we're going through these lessons of awakening. We also get again a description of the Elohim. Neville's belief that we are all the Elohim and that we are all gods. And a description and a real parsing out of this theory and explaining how it actually works that you and I are God and that we're all gods. Quoting some interesting biblical phrases, particularly this psalm that says that God has taken his place in the divine assembly. There are several visions that Neville Goddard has mentioned where he goes and he is, goes to an assembly he meets God who is love in this assembly. And so it's another idea to ponder. It's something I should have asked Julie Ryan about in my recent interview. Julie Ryan is a medical intuitive and psychic who looks into the afterlife. I should have just asked her about this particular aspect that's correlated to Swedenborg now correlated to Neville Goddard. So if you woke up and you're 20 years old, you might be in a life right now. We might all be in some weird matrix where we're all asleep in death. And so perhaps I'm just in this dream fantasy reading these lectures to slowly awaken to what I'm actually doing and to awaken to what's happening inside. Now he says we did this on purpose that we moved to an expanded world. So I am utterly fascinated and I would love to get more explanation of this. I don't understand. I don't understand what he's saying. Is he saying that he actually met people after they died because of his because he had awoken and so he was able to recognize them? I, I don't know. Check out my episode Rouse Thyself Awake that talks about this. Also, the eternal plan and the greatest blessing. All of those will talk about this aspect of the promise. I haven't done as many episodes on The Promise, but this one is certainly very interesting. And so I tell you, awake, O sleeper, awake from the dead. If you were listening to this, I am not talking to you. I'm talking to the sleeper inside of you. Awaken. I am talking to the sleeper inside of myself. Awaken. Awaken to who you truly are. If you are listening to this now, you probably have gotten a chance to listen to the wonderful audiobook, 
the impersonal life, which really explains from a first person perspective, channeled perspective of God, as if God is speaking directly to explain this. And even in the law of one, everything that we're seeing around us is all coming down to the law of one thought. We're seeing this idea of God all around us expressing itself and unfolding ever greater into evolving greatness. It's this amazing thing when you really start to ponder it. It's amazing. So we also get a full description of belief a little bit here. The idea and the importance of belief and that sweet distinction that if you believe it to be true, it will happen. This idea that you may be poor, you may be struggling, and you imagine that you are famous and you imagine that you are wealthy and those things will come to you if you can believe. So very interesting, very interesting, biblically, very interesting interpretation of Adam and Eve. The concept that we are all Adam and that Eve is the body that we made when we gave a part of a portion of our soul to create a body and that there is no female male dichotomy going on in Genesis. So I will probably read another lecture very soon. That's called Genesis 316 childbearing. It's got such a bizarre title where Neville Goddard discusses the quote in the book of Genesis of women having to suffer pain in childbearing, which has nothing to do with it. I continue to be blown away by the interpretations that Neville gives in the Bible, but I am particularly confused and interested in this idea of the afterlife. And I would love to know if any of you have a fleshed out perspective of what Neville is saying. This I think is probably the best lecture to fully explain it that I have seen so far. But if somebody knows another lecture where he goes into e even more detail about this concept that when we die, we don't reincarnate into another body where a baby in, or, or an animal, we reincarnate into another world where we are 20 years old and we continue to live in this world with a perfect body moving towards awakening. The only place that I can think of that he's got this from is Swedenborg or from his own experience and explanation. So did we all live one life and that we died? What does that mean? I don't understand. So, but I love this lecture and it was fun to read and I really appreciate you guys sharing it with me. All episodes of the reality revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to the reality revolution.